So tell me a little bit about your subject matter. Um, I work on history, or more specific, louder. I'm not bothering the people. No, that's okay. I'm working on our perception that we have with history, uh, mostly pertaining to Canadian or Acadian history. Um, pretty fascinated how, over time, uh, people's collective memory has shaped our identities, um, our identity. especially being an Acadian, there's a mixture of what's real and what's not real, um, which is always very confusing. So I like to work on what is false and what it should be. Oh. What does false mean? False is what uh, has been told to us by many people from the outside. Uh, interpret, in, interpreted it um, for political reasons, I guess, what the Canadians should be or what, what the Canadians have gone through. Do you see your work as restoring a voice? I think so. Or, or not just restoring a voice, having a voice, because there, there hasn't been a voice. <laughs> um, and being an artist, when I look at art history and Acadian perspective in history, there is absolutely no voice at all. It's all these British or European artists and American artists that fell in love with the book Longfellow. And so Longfellow's book is very sympathetic uh, to the Acadians, but it leaves, uh, it changes your perception that the people were very docile, very calm, uh, there was no uh, no rebellion, no uh, no fight against the deportation, and uh, a culture that's been lost. There's not supposed to be any Acadians left after a long close book. So all these artists, visually, that's what they read, and, that, and, that's, and that's what we see. Yeah, that's very interesting because it's it's not a hostile interpretation of Acadia, but it it's in some ways sympathetic or almost saccharine, you know, a little sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's a romantic story. Mm. Yeah, with, mm. with some, some fictionist characters that, that are in love and they get separated. And then, then they find, actually, uh, later on, they, they reunite eventually, but it's too late. Yeah. This is a good... Can you tell me a bit about this study? Yeah, that's based on Ani Bo's painting. Uh, the dispersion of the Acadians. And Nani Bo is a classically trained painter. Uh, he studied in Paris under uh, William Bogoro and Neon Jaron, which are very big neoclassical academic painters. And his painting is surprising, but it's not, it's not very academic. It's what the style at the period, 1900, with both impressionism. But his composition is very neoclassical. It's like a like you would build a theater. Like people are posing, like they would they would be in theater. Um, and he his intentions was not to stir up any political feelings at all. He did, despite that, he did stir up a lot of political feelings because people were very very proud of that painting. It won third place in the salon in Paris for that year. And it's now in Moncton. Yeah, it's in the uh, Acadian Museum in Moncton. It's very big. This is a small reproduction of it? Yeah, it's a print of a reproduction. Mm. Yeah. 
even on the both interpretation, um, you know, the coastline is not Nova Scotia, it's northern France. Uh, the people's clothes are all wrong, it's not Acadian fashion, it's more like Paris fashion uh, that, that he, he imagined. Uh, you get sort of the soldier's costume, sort of right, but not really, some of them have the wrong colors. And this, you've done a little photo based study? Yeah, uh, I hired uh, quite a few models to pose for me, and that composition is very similar to Anibo's painting. People are very calm, waiting, just waiting patiently for them to be uh, deported or, or whatever. So who are the models? Uh, they're mostly friends of mine that I asked. Uh, my wife is in the middle. She's in Ev Evangeline. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm there and um, I'm right here. <laughs> okay. And all the rest are, are friends of mine. Some of them have more than one pose. Um, and I had to do cut the costumes for them, which are more like Roman or Greek uh, robes. Why Roman and Greek robes? Um, I don't know, I think it's to the neoclassical way, it's like people who are not typically uh, normal people, people who are nobility or Roman wear. E even in 19th century painting you still see these old myth of, myth, myth of people that are like goddess or goddesses in, in these paintings, like Napoleon, he would wear a robe in a lot of paintings. Um, yeah, it's very interesting that you're incorporating, sort of going and reviving a kind of a utility within 19th century academic painting. Yeah. And this, and it's actually in some ways, you're not only reclaiming, okay, uh, you're not only reclaiming uh, Acadian history, you're kind of in a way reclaiming a kind of functionality of, or new functionality for an academic discourse in a, in the painterly in a painterly language. Yeah, because if you think about art history in Acadian terms, by Acadians, it's only since the sixties that we can really go back to. Mm -hmm. It's it's a new, fairly new thing. Uh, Forty years is not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So nobody in the nineteenth century did work like Jack uh, Jack Derrida did, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, here. Yeah. It also corresponds to, in the last 20 years, a great revival or interest within certain circles of uh, representational, you know, painting, of uh, using a painting language that is premised upon a, some would say, technical mastery, but I think that's a naive understanding of, uh, uh, of uh, let's say, of painting. Uh, that they, uh, but actually, it's very my own experience in, term, in terms of representation. Right, is that uh, it becomes very personal. The more technical it is, the more personal it is in some ways. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe answer it like I didn't ask, ask, spend so much time on the question. Um, I think it, it depends if you go to art school. Or if you go to someone that, or you, someone that teaches you very specific technique mm. versus art school, yeah. I find that some art schools they they encourage self-expression, <laughs> and the technique is a little bit not so important. Yeah. Um, is that good or bad? I don't know, but that's probably why we don't see um, a lot of realism, maybe, that comes out of art school. Yeah. Um, Whereas I had to go like in Texas to learn from one artist how to do a sort of uh, John Singer Sargent style of painting. Mm -hmm. um, but if I knew two or twenty years ago, I would have done like you know both at the same time, you know, because mm -hmm. he was very technical. There was no discourse at all, really about subject matter. But I think you need both. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wish schools would offer both, maybe. Yeah. But I guess it's depending on the teacher always, the uh, instructor. Yes, um, and uh, 
And actually, I think some people, you know, overestimate the value of both. You know, yeah. the, uh, um, yeah. Tell us a bit about these two. This is the, oh, we ta- we started here. Okay. Yeah, this is just another. Col- yeah. I do color studies a lot before I start painting. Yeah. For me, it's important to have. Uh, Decisions, decisions to be made before I start painting. Um, it's less stressful for me to go that way. I admire people that are very spontaneous, but I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I sympathize. <Yeah. laughs> uh, it's. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about this painting? Yeah, and this is just another importation of the Alibo painting. Um, instead of people being very calm and docile, um, we have what I imagine to be more real and more chaos. Because we do know how, we do now know that people weren't very calm during the deportations. They were, it was a very chaotic scene, um, very loud. Uh, a lot of people very upset, of course, you can, you can imagine, and so uh, very aggressive also. So this is what I thought that would, would be more realistic for me, that all these artists throughout the years have not captured what the scene should have been. Once again, in these sort of uh, mythic costumes. Hmm. Still with the costumes, yeah. yeah. Out of time. Yeah. Uh, this is a study. And there was a study, a study that mentioned something to me and I, and I didn't. I haven't thought about it, but for her, these costumes, is, they're more distinguishable. That, that you know that these people are there's something special. If there were normal, uh, let's say, normal um, wear at the time, you wouldn't really pay that much attention. And I thought that was a good point. Mm-hmm. I, really, I really didn't think about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're, you're right away you're saying, okay, these British soldiers are from a, 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 an era, yeah. obviously, like a colonial era. But why are these people wearing robes? And, yeah, yeah it, it, it does signify a difference. I wonder if you put a halo. Well, the, the, the other paintings were they were nude. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know if you can notice through the slides that they're not here, but they have halos. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. and there was a comment about uh, the religion and... And martyrdom? Martyrdom and all mm-hmm. that stuff, yeah. yeah. The struggles that people, like, I still... It still happens today when people are so attached to their faith that they would actually, uh, what do you call that, sacrifice, you know? Yeah, you know, And that. throughout history, it's been, it's been like that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then you still stick to it. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, well, soldiers march off to war on behalf of nationals, so That's flags right. and stuff. So. That's right. It's one's so, beliefs, yeah. It's, uh, tell us a bit about this painting here. Um, this is uh, Charles de Chant de Bois de Bellarto. <laughs> he has a long name because he's from nobility. Uh-huh. And uh, each area that the nobles would control, I guess, they add on to their own names. So he had two areas in France where his family um, were in possession of. And he was sent, um, he was the military leader here in the Maritimes to, to fight against the English. And there were many battle scenes around London uh, where he won and he, or he lost and he fought a lot along with the militia also. Uh, big characters like Bosse de Broussal, that was a famous uh, pirate, um, and his family and other people. So his, uh, his uh, principal challenger would have been Robert Monkton? Yes, his big adversary was Monkton. Yeah, he did fight against Winslow only once or twice, but Moncton was, they were always at odds. 